Everybody clap your hands like this. you we exalt you God you're a wonderful God we worship and magnify your holy name God you're such a good God such an amazing God such a powerful God and not just God but you are our father God God we love you we worship and magnify your name on today father God in the name of Jesus we come in this place God 
reverencing you, magnifying, exalting, lifting up your holy name, magnifying you, making you bigger, making you greater than any trouble, any situation that we may be dealing with, God. God, we lay it at your feet, God. We cast our cares upon you for you care for us, God. We lay it at your feet, God. God, we want to worship you, God. Hallelujah. Father, we pray right now, God, that you will forgive us of any sins, God, that we may have said, that we may have done, God, any thoughts, God. God, anything we've done against you, God, we repent, God. God, we ask that you cleanse us, wash us, forgive us, God. In the name of Jesus, Father, we pray, God, for the service, God, those that are in the sanctuary, those that are watching online. God, we pray, God, that you move by your power, that you move by your spirit. In the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. We pray for our bishop, God. God, that you will speak to him, God, that you continue to put fire in his belly, God, to speak your word, God, to declare your word in this place. God, we pray over his wife, First Lady Vanessa, and their sons, God. We pray that you cover them. God, cover the word of God, church and ministry, family, God, here and internationally, God, worldwide. Father, you be glorified. You be exalted, God. You be lifted up, God. We worship and magnify you, God. You be glorified in Jesus' name. Come on, lift it up in this place. He is worthy. Come on, he is worthy. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on. You are worthy, Lord. Come on, let's sing it real quick. You are worthy, Lord. Come on, lift it up. Come on. You are worthy, Lord. 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 enough to give God the praise. Come on, clap those hands. Sing, I will bless. I will bless the Lord at all times. And His praise. And His praise. Shall be in my mind. No matter what I no see. No matter what I see or how I feel. As long as I'm breathing. As long as I'm breathing. Oh, yes, I'm breathing. Yeah. I'll bless the Lord. As long as I'm breathing. As long as I'm breathing. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, I'm breathing. Come on. Oh, oh, magnify. Come on, lift your hands right here. Let us exalt. Let us Did you come to exalt the Lord today? Name. Together. Together. Let's lay down our feelings, Let's our crown. Down, Come on. Now. And lift the Savior up. up. Come on. Now let's do it together. Come on, pull your neighbors and let's do it together. Hey. Let's, let's do it together. Come on. 
Sing, let's do it together. Let's do it together. Come on, nudge him a little bit. Come on, let's do it together. Hey. Let's do it together. Did anybody come to worship her? Sing, let's do it together. Let's do it together. That's the only way it works. Huh? Sing, let's do it together. Let's do it together. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let's do it together. Let's do it together. Can somebody join me at the altar? Come on. Say, let's do it together. Come on and join me in worship. Let's hey. do it together. Come on, if you're not afraid, come on and join me at the altar. Let's do it together. Let's, hey. Let's do it together. You've been better than good. Listen. You've been better than good. You've been better than good to me. Is that anybody testimony? Hey, you've been better than good. You've been better than good to I'm me. I'm looking at a few people that has testified the Lord has been good. Hey. You've been better than good to me. You've been better than good. Come on. You've been better than good. You've been better than good to me. I want you to raise your voice. Hey. You've been better than good. You've been better than good to me. Hey. hey. You've been better than good. Hey. You've been better than good to me. Lift those voice in this place. You've been better than good. You've been better than good We've to me. We've come to worship the mighty God. You've been better than good. You've been better than good to me. Here we go. Sing, I should have been dead. I should have been dead. But he brought you here today. You've been better than good to me. Yeah. I should have lost my mind. Say it one more time because nobody somebody need to think about it. Hey, I should have lost my mind. I should have been dead. Hey, I should have been dead. And I should have lost my mind. Come on, lift it up. Should have lost my mind. Oh, oh. Should have lost my mind. You better than good. Hey, come on, lift it up, man. Hey, you've been better than good. You've been better than good. Hallelujah. You've been better than good. Hey. You've been better than good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. This is my testimony. The Lord brought me out. I should have lost my mind. I should have given up a long time ago. But the Lord stepped in and He made a Make his name greater. Come on. Lift the worshiper. Make his name greater. You are good. Yes, you are, Jesus. Yes, you are God. Yeah. Sing, you are good. So good. Real good. Still good, you are. You are good. Hey, still good. So Your praise. If you know the Lord's been good, lift up your praise. 
Lift up the worship if you know the Lord's been good. He kept your mind. He's kept your body. He saved you from sin. Hallelujah. He saved you from destruction. Is that anybody testimony in this place? That the Lord's been good. Come on. Why don't you testify? Why don't you worship him? Why don't you praise the Lord? Why don't you bless his name? For the Lord is good. For the Lord is great. And greatly to be praised. I will bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord. On Monday. On Tuesday. On Wednesday. On Thursday. On Friday. On Saturday. And when we get to Sunday. There will be a Shabbat in my mouth. There will be a Hallelujah in my belly. There will be a praise. Let your praise testify. Let your hands testify. How good the Lord has been to you. Let your feet testify. I will enter in his gates with thanksgiving. His courts with praise. His courts with praise. His courts with praise. His courts with praise. praise. Come on, lift it up. Lift it up. You are the great king. You are the lifter of my head. You are the lifter of my head.
in the sanctuary and bless the name that's above every name. Yeah. Lift him up high, throw your head. Lord, we love you, oh, hallelujah. Lord, you're worthy, Lord, you're worthy. Lord, you're great, Lord, you're great. Lord, you're mighty.
Say, I'll sing your praise. I'll sing your praise. Come on, say. Hey, sing, you have rescued. You have rescued my life. You have, you have rescued my life. And I'm never, I'm never going. Come on, lift it up. Sing, you have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. you. Oh, 
never going back. We're never going back. When we consider what we once was before you saved us, we were a mess, a wretch undone. We were lost on our way to hell, on our way away from you, God. But God, you rescued us, saved us from ourselves, saved us from iniquity and sin, God. God, you have rescued us. And we make the declaration, we shall not go back. We are never going back. Regardless of what may come our way, we're not going back. We'll follow you, God, forever and always, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father God, we thank you. We thank you once again for your spirit being even in this place, God. Thank you for meeting us here, God. God, we pray right now, God, in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, you continue to have your way in this atmosphere in the name of Jesus. God, we pray for our bishop once again. God, that you will speak through him, God. That you will use him for your glory, God. God, that you will even open our ears, God, our hearts to receive your word on today, God. And God, let us not just be hearers, but doers of your word, God. Help it to settle into our spirits, God. Let it fall on fertile ground, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Help us receive it with gladness and to apply it to our lives, God. Holy Ghost, we love you. Father, we love you. Savior, we reverence you for rescuing our lives. And we shall never go back. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise if you know that he has rescued your life. Hallelujah. You have rescued my life. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. God is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Name of the Lord. It's worthy to be praised. You have rescued my Redeemer. You've rescued my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. 
We give honor to God, to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We recognize the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. We honor our leaders, our ministers, our elders, our pastors, our deacons. We acknowledge and celebrate and honor our first lady who has her birthday on this week had her birthday happy birthday lady davis moving on up the ladder girl moving on up the ladder those of you who may not know she celebrates the whole month so you have plenty of time <laughs> um, I have a arduous and interesting assignment today one that I think calls for great maturity to understand and process what I'm about to teach I say that not only to the audience who is sitting before me, but the audience who is listening to me, that some elements and aspects of this teaching are going to challenge you. They are going to challenge you on a spiritual level, probably for a great many of us, it will challenge us maybe more so on an emotional level. The subject that I'm about to deal with is very difficult to navigate without people's emotions getting into it. I would ask you, particularly those who listen to me on stream, to please hear me as I teach this today in context. The argument that I'm about to lay out has to be heard in its proper context. I'm likely not able to finish this argument today. I doubt it. At best, I'll probably be able to lay down much of the framework for the foundation so that I can make a consistent and continuing argument that I think is very needed, very critical at this time in this country and in particular before the return of the Lord, there are some things that we as the church and the country have to get straight. So one would wonder, ask, why is Bishop going to teach the things that I'm going to teach and in the way? I need you to understand that this is not about flesh or blood. This is spirit, but I have to go through flesh and blood to get there. I need you to go in your Bibles to Philemon. Probably not one of the most popular books in the Bible. In the New Testament, I was going to say, is probably in the top five least read. I'd probably put it in the top three least read books in the scripture. Or let me say it this way, least preached or taught. I need you to start at verse 8. The word of the Lord reads, Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, 
Yet for love's sake, I'd rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. I am sending him back. You therefore receive him, that is my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing, that your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. With God's permission and the leading of the Holy Spirit, I want to preach to you from three letters that have become very popular in the contemporary media in the country but I want to give them in another context. I want to preach to you this morning from the subject C-R-T. Now, for those of you who hear that, your immediate thought with C-R-T, based on how the media pushes these letters, is probably going to be critical race theory. That's not my message. CRT for me is Christian race theology. CRT, Christian race theology. It's good to see Pastor McCray is with us this morning in service. Hallelujah. Good to see you, brother. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise. For you are worthy of it, God, and I need you right now. I can't do this by myself. I need a fresh anointing. I need your revelation, your insight. I need your glory. Anything that's in me, God, that's not like you, I repent of it, God. I ask that you purge me with hyssop that I may be clean. Hallelujah, God, I need you. I need you. We need you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Let every heart say amen. amen. CRT, Christian Race Theology. We are in the throes of a time in this nation that is probably very similar akin to many of the sentiments and feelings prior to the Civil War. There are many people who believe that we are on the cusp of a civil war in this nation by virtue of the attitudes and the feelings and the sentiments that are going on in this country. One of the agitations that's in this nation is something that has been around for probably 40 years in scholarship and theory, this idea of CRT, that race informs almost all policies and systems, or racism does, due to the biases that are in the hearts and the mind of people, that race is 
a factor in almost everything that goes on in this country. The argument of CRT is that race is a social construct, something that society creates that divides us. The opponents of CRT who, CRT who are largely Caucasian, many of them considered to be moderate, conservative, are offended by the idea and the notion that their children would be taught and educated under the premise of white guilt. That the children are going to be exposed to liberal, progressive ideologies that would make them feel guilty for being white in this country. And as a result, would damage their psyche and to some degree unfairly advantage other groups because it would handcuff their ability to have their own pursuit of life, happiness, and liberty. It is interesting because I told you this is not an argument for me of flesh because I have the responsibility of looking at what goes on in the nation and in the world from a position where any of my personal ideologies are informed by my theological understanding and the doctrine that comes out of it. So regardless of how I may feel, I have to operate according to what I know. I'm not going to pretend that as an African American male that I don't feel the things that go on in this society. But I know that we don't operate by how we feel. As Christians, we operate by faith. By faith, I don't put my confidence in the American government. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. By faith, I put no great confidence in any form of human government. But by faith, my vantage point of the American democracy does not refute what one would call patriotism or loyalty. I just hold no high regard for human government because they're governments of men predicated on the hearts of men. I love Revelation 11 and I want you to just quickly read it with me when this seventh trumpet is sounded, trumpet is sounded and the Seven angel makes the declaration in the 11th chapter of Revelation. And I think that this is a powerful understanding that we should have as Christians. The Bible says in verse 15, and I got to move. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. So when the angel makes this declaration, he is making the direct declaration over all kingdoms and nations and governments and saying, now the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God and his Christ. Now the reign and the rulership of God is taking over in the earth. Now you're about to see what government really is supposed to look like. Now you're going to see what authority is supposed to be. Democracy is but a cheap imitation of theocracy. It wants the results of theocracy, but it does not employ the principles of theocracy. Theocracy is a government that's governed by God. Democracy tries to imitate aspects of it, but denies core principles. Democracy 
is based on you having rights. Theocracy is based on you having righteousness. I feel like teaching just a little bit. Democracy is successful at the achievement of rights. Theocracy is successful at the achievement of righteousness. Be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Democracy operates on an individual's perception or values. Values are based on an individual's understanding of what is right or wrong. God operates a nation based on morals, which is God's perspective of what is right or wrong for a society. Democracy or in a democracy, a person can have certain values that ignore the morals of God. As long as this is important to me, I have certain rights that may not or don't have to be righteous, but they're my rights. And so as a result, the majority rules. Oh God, help me today. But in a theocracy, it is the majority of one, and that is God. Many people, as I begin this teaching, feel like bringing in social constructs and history into the spirit realm should not happen. But I would argue to you that one of the greatest sermons in the Bible that brought about the greatest result was at Pentecost when Peter, having just received the gift of the Holy Spirit and being sealed by the Spirit, and while he is dealing internally within himself about this manifestation of the Spirit that he has received, he has an assignment to bring diverse men of all nations together under the government of God or the theocracy of God or to that kingdom understanding, but he cannot do it without confronting history and guilt. Help me, Holy Spirit. In the message where Peter begins to tell them that these men are not drunk as you suppose, and he begins to give them the prophecy of Joel, he does not stop there. He begins to deal from a historical context. In order to get them to the spirit realm, he must go through history. And I submit to you that as much as Peter had his assignment to get those who were at Pentecost to the spirit realm and had to go through history, if I am to do my assignment properly, I must go through history too. Peter asserts to them that they had taken Jesus by lawless hands. And by lawless, he was not talking about the laws of men because they went through a court proceeding according to the law, but they had broken the law of God by crucifying the Christ. So when he asserts they did it by lawless hands, it's not that they did not adhere to human or natural law, but rather they had broken the law of God. Then he goes through the history and says, permit me to speak freely. This is the sermon that Peter preached that brought 3,000 souls, but he said, permit me to speak freely. Permit me to tell y'all the truth. Then he begins to go back in history and he goes to the patriarch David and he walks through the historical account all the way up to Jesus. And then in the end of that, the Bible says in Acts 2 and 37 that when they heard this, 37, they heard this, they were pricked or cut to their heart. 
which intimates guilt. America wants to declare a history that is guiltless. America wants a history that is discussed free of guilt. But I submit to you, it is the guilt that brings us to the place of conversion. Help me, Holy Spirit. It, it, it is the awareness of the guilt that brings us to a place of repentance. How many of us, if you had not confronted your guilt, would you ever have changed? Would you ever have gotten to the place where you put away the things that you did formerly if you had not confronted your When do you look at your personal history? Oh, I got to tell it to you truthfully. When you look at who you used to be and what you used to do, it's very difficult for you to tell your history and avoid your guilty places. You have to be honest about your own guilt. That's why when most of us testify, the first thing we have to say, I was a sinner. And Paul said, I was chief of sinners and I was a wretch undone. God wouldn't finish with me. Ah! I, when I look at my history, the only thing I can say is that God was not finished with me. And for the deeds, I'm guilty. America wants a guiltless history. They don't want their children to know their guilt. They don't want to have a discussion that conjures up that guilt. But if we are to be Christian, the Bible says we have to speak the truth in love. This is where it gets difficult for many of us because our emotions sometimes cancel out the love of the truth. Our emotions and our anger sometimes overcome, or uh, take over us, and it's very difficult for us to deal with the truth and it not be done in a spirit of love. I'm taking my time with this today. The history of the U.S. as it relates to slavery is very different from that of the slavery of the Bible. I have to deal with history. Deliverance in the Bible of a people from enslavement often required, help me Holy Spirit, the delivery of said people from the place of their enslavement. Let me put it in context. The deliverance of the Hebrews from slavery required that the Hebrews had to leave Egypt. So the deliverance was predicated on the delivery of the people to a new place. The deliverance of the Jews in Germany from the oppression of the Nazis required the removal of the people from the place of oppression. America is in the unique position of the deliverance of the slave keeps them in the place of their oppression. Asked the former enslaver 
to exist with the formerly enslaved as equals. This the Holy Spirit revealed to me would be akin to the Egyptians having released the Hebrews and the Hebrews leaving the land of their oppressor only to get to the Red Sea and cannot cross. And as many of them wanted to, have to return to Egypt, the land of their oppressor and oppression, and try to coexist. The reason that Pharaoh, after having lost their firstborn sons of the nation, even at this great loss, would rather have suffered the loss of their own children than suffer the loss of the Hebrews serving them. It was Pharaoh who said, why have we done this thing and let the Hebrews go from serving us? And they pursued them to bring them back because ultimately Pharaoh wanted his system back. His system was greater than even the loss of his own children. In the Civil War, the Confederacy lost their firstborn sons much like Pharaoh did. And even at the loss of their firstborn sons, what was more relevant and greater to them was the loss of their system. And what God showed me is that Jim Crow in America is like the Hebrews coming back to Egypt. It is not just the people returning, it is them gaining back the system that the Civil War had caused them to lose. I gotta walk slowly through this. The idea that in America, race does not inform our history and our decisions is a falsehood. The country, this democratic experiment was predicated on some of the premises that I've just put before you. I need the Holy Spirit to walk me through this. Race is a critical component of it. The system of oppressing another person, slavery is at the foundation of it. It is an experiment that is doomed to fail because it is not a theocracy. It is based on the values, whether right or wrong, not the morals of God, but the values that people accept in their heart. At the beginning of the experiment, the values of the very presidents who established the country were not that of God. The first 12 presidents, including George Washington, owned slaves. I'm going somewhere. I need y'all to stay with me. So when we talk in context of our founding fathers, it's hard for you to be my father when I'm your slave. 
I feel like I need to teach in here. Abraham Lincoln, who is purported at being the liberator of African Americans in this country, was by his own value system a colonizer. Abraham did not release or attempt to release the African Americans in this country because of the love he had for them or the value that he saw in them. I just need to teach before I go further. It was a lesser of evils. He was trying to preserve the union that was divided under his presidency and he, by his own admission, if he could have avoided the slavery issue and kept the union together, he would have avoided slavery altogether. It's just that one faction of the country was so committed to their system that they would rather fight and divide to let their system go. One of the not talked about speeches of Abraham Lincoln, he called, then called Negro leaders together in the White House and suggested to them that the problem for race and the divide in the country was because Negroes were in the country. That maybe the way to solve the problem is to get Negroes out of the country. So the great Abraham Lincoln solution was not an emancipation proclamation. It was to send black people to Haiti, Central America, and back to Africa. He was a colonizer. He wanted to establish a black colony somewhere else and extend Western dominance. His idea was not for us to cohabitate. That wasn't his original value. The Confederacy forced him to have to use a War Powers Act of the Union soldiers to fight to release slaves to keep the country together, to make the Confederacy release their system. I'm just trying to teach before I... One of the chief components of changing Abraham Lincoln's ideology, much like Martin Luther King did John F. Kennedy, who also did not have a great desire to deal with civil rights, but was forced to. When the cameras were put on children being brutalized in the streets, it forced John F. Kennedy to have to deal with the issue of race. I know y'all are wondering where I'm going with this, but I told you, Peter had to go through the history to get to the conversion. Stay with me. So, Frederick Douglass begins to be the person in the ear that causes Abraham Lincoln to give the kind of speech of four score and three years ago, he did not have those values were it not for Douglas's assertions that not only indicted the president, the nation, but here it is, also the church. In a speech that was delivered on July 4th, entitled by Frederick Douglass, I need you to put it up on the screen. What is to a slave the 4th of July? I need to read this. Frederick says, my subject then, fellow citizens, is American slavery. I shall see this day and its popular characteristics from the slave's point of view. 
standing there, identified with the American bondman, making his wrongs mine, I do not hesitate to declare with all my soul that the character and conduct of this nation never looked blacker to me than on this 4th of July. Now, mind you, he's speaking to 600 white supporters. He says, whether we turn to the declaration of the past or to the professions of the present, the conduct of the nation seems equally hideous and revolting. America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future. Standing with God and the crust and bleeding slave on this occasion, I will, next slide. In the name of humanity, which is outraged, in the name of liberty, which is fettered, in the name of the Constitution and the Bible, which are disregarded and trampled upon, dare to call into question and to denounce with all the emphasis I can command everything that serves to perpetuate slavery, the great sin and shame of America. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will use the severest language I can command, and yet not one word shall escape me that any man whose judgment is not blinded by presidents or presidents or who is not at heart a slaveholder shall not confess to be right and just. Next slide. What is the American slave in your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all the other days of the year the gross injustices and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. Your boasted, your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciation of tyrants, your brass-fronted impotence, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgiving with all your religious parade and solemnity are to him more bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation in the earth, uh, uh, on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. Go where you may, search where you will, roam through all the monarchies and despotisms of the old world, travel through South America, search out every abuse, and when you have found the last, lay your facts by the side of everyday practices of this nation, and you will say with me, that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without a rival. He concludes and he further reads, and this is where I'm really going. He says, a worship that can be conducted by persons who refuse to give shelter to the houseless, to give bread to the hungry, clothing to the naked, and who enjoin obedience to a law forbidding these acts of mercy is a curse, not a blessing to mankind. The Bible addresses all such persons as scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites who pay tithes of mint, anise, and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. But the church of this country is not only indifferent to the wrongs of the slave, it actually takes sides with the oppressor. It has made itself the bulwark of American slavery and the shield of American slave hunters. Many of his most eloquent divines who stand as the very light of the church have shamelessly given the sanction of religion and the Bible to the whole slave system. 
They have taught that men may properly be a slave, that the relation of master and slave is ordained of God, that to send back an escape bondman to his master is clearly the duty of the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this horrible blasphemy is palmed off upon the world for Christianity. I'm going somewhere. Frederick Douglass accused the American church and its greatest ideal as being hypocrites, no different than the Pharisees, scribes, and Sadducees because of slavery and the practice of it and the endorsement of it by the church. Wait, wait. See, I'm a researcher. So the Holy Spirit said, Go look at the Articles of Secession as stated by South Carolina. Put the Article of Secession. These are the exact words of the state of South Carolina who seceded from the Union and who professes that it was not because of slavery that they seceded from the Union, but because of the abuses of the democracy and the government. But these are the actual words, and I think it's very important for you to understand that these articles were written but signed in what is now called, or what was called, Institute Hall, which is in First Baptist Church, downtown Columbia. So I need you to be clear that the articles of secession that caused the Confederacy to break from the country, South Carolina's articles were signed in the church downtown Columbia right now. And this is their reasoning. Thus, the constituted compact has been deliberately broken and disregarded by the non-slaveholding states and the consequences follow that South Carolina is released from her obligation. The ends for which the Constitution was framed are declared by itself to be to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. These ends it endeavor to accomplish by a federal government in which each state was recognized as an equal and has separate control of its own institution. Here it is. The right of property in slaves was recognized by giving to free persons distinct political rights, by giving them the right to represent and burthening them with direct taxes for three-fifths of their slaves, by authorizing the important importation of slaves for 20 years and by stipulating for the rendition of fugitives from labor. We affirm that these ends for which the government was instituted have been defeated and the government itself has been made destructive of them by the action of non-slaveholding states. Those states have assumed the right of deciding upon the propriety of our domestic institutions and have denied the rights of property, meaning people, established in the 15 states and recognized by the Constitution. They have denounced, look at this, as sinful the institution of slavery, they have permitted open establishment among them of societies which avowed object is to disturb the peace and to alloy the property of the citizens of other states. They have encouraged and assisted thousands of our slaves to leave their homes and those who remain have been incited by emissaries, books, and pictures to serve, to serve our insurrection. They are saying very clearly, the church, Christian articles are saying, the government is saying that our Conduct of slavery is sinful. Wait, wait, wait. The government is telling a part of the nation and the church, your actions are sinful, and the church is advocating for the sin. I need to put this in context. What Frederick Douglass said has been purported to be the church to the world was advocating for the sin of slavery and willing to die and fight for it the way Pharaoh was willing to die in Egypt and fight to hold the Hebrews. The difference is the government was formed with people who professed to be Christians at the heart of it. 
And this is the attitude and the history that brings us to present point. Now, you may say, what is the relevance? In that, they, they talk about they were charged taxes for what was called the three-fifth compromise. I'm about to preach, but I gotta get this last history out. Now, what this is, is the three-fifth compromise, but many of you don't understand the significance of even to this day. Your electoral college of these United States is formed on what is called the three-fifth compromise. Three-fifth compromise is the fact that the North had more people per se, but actually when you look at the statistics, it was about even, but the North had voting citizens, whereas the South had an equal amount of people, but a majority of them were slaves. And slaves could not vote. So even though there were an equal amount of people, a, a significant portion were not by race regarded as people. They were chattel. They were property. And property couldn't vote. So the electoral college had to be formed because if you voted in a majority population in the nation, then the South would unfortunately be compromised because they don't have enough people to vote. So they then had to declare the property called slaves as three-fifths of a person. So every five slaves equal three people. And the weight of the electoral college is based on census. How many people you have? So though the slaves could not be treated as people to live, they were treated as three-fifths of a people for the purpose of a vote. But they had no voice in the vote because their vote aligned with their master's vote. So whatever their masters wanted is what the slaves wanted by default. Now, many of you listen to me now and you're trying to understand where is he going with this and I'm showing you that in order for this to be fixed, it can only be fixed through the church, but if the church does not do its job and stand up to its responsibility, I don't care how much you protest, I don't care how much you vote, I don't care what you do, until the church realizes its purpose in the nation, it's not going to change. The electoral college still operates very similar to the slave system of its origin. How am I saying this? Well, when you are an African-American male and you get a felony for selling dope, having dope, or having a gun, you lose your rights, Second Amendment right, you can't carry a gun, you lose the right to vote. However, you are still even in prison, counted in the census. Now, you hear what I'm saying? You are still, just like the slave, numbered in the population, but you can't vote. So your vote is lumped in with the majority. So some of y'all who are listening to me, the same slave system is still in operation today. How many of you in here have maybe unjustly been hanged with a felony because you had crack cocaine and a Caucasian man had powder cocaine and his sentence was deemed as a misdemeanor and yours as a felony. He was smoking the same dope in the eyes of God, but he can vote, he can have a gun, he can do whatever, but you, uh, you're not hearing what I'm trying to teach. What is the spiritual part of this? Where am I going? I'm not trying to incite you to anger. I, and just like Peter, I'm trying to cut somebody to their heart. And it may be that the person that needs to be cut to the heart is not in this room. Maybe it's somebody who is listening who has a false view of history and it takes the truth in love. Someone who is professing to be Christian but still holds these values of their forefathers and ancestors and will fight for them and argue for them and do not understand that what the Bible says when you're supposed to be in the world but not of the world. And so even though you may be in a race, if you're a Christian, you're not of that race because when you become a Christian, you have now become a part of another race. And when you understand that there is a race per se of Christians in the earth that we don't think like the world, operate like the world, and so you can 
cannot hold to your historical values and hold to the to the kingdom values of Christ at the same time. Be you black man, white man. I need you to go to Ephesians, uh, uh, Galatians 3 and 26 for me. I need you to go to Galatians 3 and 26. Now I can preach. After I've set historical context, now I can preach. Help me, Holy Spirit. Because y'all sitting here looking like deer trapped in the headlight and like you're scared. And all I've done is tell the truth. The Bible says this, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as uh, of you as were baptized into Christ, he says, having put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither slave nor free. And so if a slave was saved in the eyes of the church, the Bible says there's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free. The scripture says there's neither the male, neither male, nor female, female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And so if the church had done its job, we would not be talking about uh, uh, critical race theory. If the church was doing its job, we'd be talking about Christian race theology because it's not just about espousing it, it's about living it. And Peter knew that he had to preach a message to get them to the spirit. He had to get them to understand the error of their history because once they accepted Christ, they had to come into community with one another. Devout men of all nations had to come together and put aside their differences and be one in Christ. If nobody else is one in the nation, the race of the church shouldn't be no black church, shouldn't be no white church, shouldn't be no Hispanic church, shouldn't be no green, blue church. There is but one church in the earth. We are a people. And the hypocrisy of a church that argues for the enslavement of their own people. You're going to enslave me because I don't look like you, but I confess the same Christ. I confess the same God. I serve the same God. Help me, Holy Spirit. Can I teach? Now, in order... To comprehend this, you got to be in spirit. In order to operate in this, you got to be in spirit. Because if you look in the flesh, all you see is differences. All you see is people who are not alike. In order to embrace this, comprehend this, live in this, walk in this, you have to be bathed in the spirit. You have to be. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to indwell in you, guide you, lead you. And just like Caucasians will try to hold to their past, blacks will try to hold to theirs. We won't trust. We won't love. We won't connect. We will segregate. We will isolate because we can't believe that you are uh, the Christian you profess to be because those like you who profess to be Christians before enslaved our people and, 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 and put us in bondage and killed, sang hymns while they were doing lynchings. I need you to go to 2 Corinthians 5. I got to bust this open. But we're real quiet in here. Second Corinthians 5, 16. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh even though we have known Christ according to the flesh yet now we know him thus no longer let me bust the whole foundation of the American church up right now let me bust everything that we have known to be the Christian church in America, how it has been purported, Im the images that it has displayed. Let me help you in your thinking right now and show you the error. I don't even have to go to slavery. I just go to the image that is depicted as Jesus. The Bible says we now no longer regard. This is why I taught you about being in the resurrected life of Christ, that we are not in the crucified life of Christ. We are in the resurrected life of Christ. We're walking in the newness of life. I preached that to you a couple weeks ago, but your mind has 
to understand what it means to be in a resurrected life. And here's why we're not identifying with the crucified Christ. He's a Palestinian Jew. He's a man who is in the flesh. And the problem with you as a Christian is identifying with him in the natural. You can never perfectly yoke to him in the natural. You are not a Palestinian Jew. He's not a Palestinian Jew. But if any man be in Christ in spirit, everybody is made new. And so what the Bible says is we now, Christians, no longer regard Christ after the flesh. How dare you put an image of a white Jesus? I feel like teachers. How dare you put an image of a white Jesus knowing what the church has represented in the nation? How dare you, Mr. Theologian, Mr. Preacher, put an image of a white Jesus up before the world and say this is God when in fact the Bible says we who are in the spirit no longer regard him in the flesh. Don't you dare put a black image, a white image. Don't you dare limit Jesus to the flesh because you ostracize and keep his people out. How dare you profess to be in God and you make his image look like you. We who are Christian now no longer regard Jesus after the flesh. I feel like teaching. Help me, Holy Spirit, I need you. This is why many of you are messed up in your kingdom mindset and I'm going to help break it over the course of this month. You are messed up in your kingdom mindset because you can't even identify with your Savior because you identify with him in the flesh and when you bend your knees to pray, you see the image of a blue-eyed, white, long hair and the Bible is telling me and Jesus is telling me and the Spirit is telling me to destroy that image in your mind. It never should have been in your spirit. It never should have been in your psyche it never should have been in the church you should not have to be rid of it I feel like teaching it here that is not Jesus I feel like teaching that is not Jesus that is a figment of hatred that is a figment of individuals who believe in superiority and inferiority. It is not the tenant of the church. It is not the tenant of the kingdom. It is not the tenant of God's son who came to the earth that all men may be saved. Even Jesus, when he was in the body of the flesh, the Bible said he came to his own. Now he was in that season for a moment when he was a Palestinian Jew, but the Bible said his own received him not. But he said, forget y'all to as many as would receive him to them gave he the power so he said come here black man come here white man come here Asian man come here Hispanic man I need everybody to come into the oneness of Jesus and I need you to show my people that I came to deliver all mankind for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever 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 Whosoever, whosoever, whosoever. <laughs> believes in him shall be saved. He didn't say believe in him as white. He didn't say believe in him as black. He didn't say believe in him as Asian. He said just believe in him. Somebody in here has got a witness in their spirit. Somebody in here knows you've been lied to. Somebody here knows that the enemy has tried to corrupt you. He didn't just try to corrupt you. He corrupted your own brothers who believe that that image is the image of Jesus and that he only represents them. And the Bible tells me, do not regard them as an enemy, but admonish them as a brother. I'm not trying to make you angry at your white Christian brothers. I'm not trying to make you angry at your white Christian sisters, but you got to speak the truth in love. You got to tell them we no longer regard God Christ after the flesh you are in error if you put an image of Jesus and made him look like you and think I'm going to serve him you must be out of your mind I serve the risen savior I serve the vivified savior I am 
am a child of the most high God. I'm not limited by race. I'm not limited by color. I'm not limited by creed. I'm released in the spirit. Help me, Holy Spirit. I need to teach in here. These are the tenants I told you. There is no way I can unpack all of this in one sermon. But I, I, what, what the Holy Spirit is revealing to me, that I had to take you through some form of history just for you to understand where God is trying to take you. I promise you, this is a kingdom message that's not limited to any one race or people. But in order to get all races of people, I got to do what Peter did. I got to give you the shocking truth. I got to give you the hard truth. Guilt has to be laid where it has to be laid. Everybody's got to accept their responsibility. Responsibility. You got to accept your responsibility for thinking like a slave. You got to accept your responsibility for thinking like you're less than anybody. You got to accept your responsibility. If any man be in Christ, he ain't no slave. He's a new creature and all things are passed away. I can do all things. I'm not limited by government. I'm not limited by people. I'm not limited by demons. I'm not limited by devils. I can do all things. I can do all things. I can. I feel like I need to preach in here. What are you talking about? You are a child of the most high God. You are son, daughter of the kingdom of God. And you're talking about what somebody won't let you do. You must be out of your mind. If God called you, if God spoke to you, if God has directed you, there ain't a devil in hell, not height, not depth, not things present, not things to come. If God is ordering your step, you don't know who you are. You are only limited by your own mind. Let me give you a Bible for as many, for as many, for as many. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there ain't no slave. There is liberty. For as many as are led by the liberty of the Holy Spirit, these Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? And I'm not even asking this from a historical context. I'm asking this from a, a spiritual context. I'm not asking this from history. I'm asking this from epistology, the epistles. Let me ask you a free a question. Are you free? <laughs> no, you don't hear what I'm asking you. You don't hear what I'm asking you. Because this is Black History Month. And in Black History Month, we want to talk about slavery. We want to talk about civil rights. We want to talk about what we come out of. But I'm here to ask you in the spirit, are you free? Because whom the Son has made free is free indeed. Hallelujah. I wonder if I have any free witnesses. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord. Let the redeemed of the Lord. Let the redeemed of the Lord. Do I have any free people? Do I have any free people? Free to worship. Free to run. Free to dance. Free to live. Free to praise. Do I have any free people? Do I have any free people? Do I have any free people? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Free your 
your mind. This is a liberation Sunday. Free your spirit. Throw out the shackles of slavery. Throw out the shackles of bondage. Throw out the shackle of history. Let that stuff go. Whom the Son has made free. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Do you feel your liberty? 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now in liberty, there is no vengeance. In liberty, we release anger. In liberty, I forgive my oppressor. In liberty, we release the slave. This is why the Holy Spirit led me to Philemon and Onesimus. Because when you come into the liberty of the Spirit, you don't act like society acts. I know what happens to people who are in the flesh called black because I'm in it too. But I ain't of it. So I ain't angrily marching with Black Lives Matter because I'm free. I know what you're saying happens to people in regard to those who look like me. But if they're not of what I'm of. <laughs> you know not what you are of. The Holy Spirit had to deal with me. And he had to deal with me about our collective thinking. And he, he had to chasten me to change my speaking, my speech, but it had to begin with my thought pattern. We don't understand that we've been so conditioned to regard one another after the flesh that all of the glorious things that God does in our life, we give credit to the flesh. So we limit what God does in our lives because if he does it through us, he can't get the glory. I'm giving you a kingdom principle. The Bible tells me do all things to the glory of God. That means I'm not limited from doing anything as long as I do it to God's glory. But we have been so conditioned by race that we give glory to race that belongs to God. You move in a house that God puts you in in a neighborhood that others don't want you in and then you say, I'm the first black man, the first white woman, black man, black woman to be here. God says, my putting you in that house had nothing to do with your race. I need a Christian in the neighborhood. I need somebody saved in the neighborhood. I need somebody who knows God in the neighborhood. It ain't got nothing to do with your race. All of the accomplishments that we make as African-Americans because of the effect of race, 
We attribute all of our successes, be us Christian or not, to race. You don't see others who are minorities doing it because they don't have an issue with who they are. Slavery has damaged us in terms of who we are. And when I found myself thinking about things and God says, that's your old damage, let that go. You don't hear Hispanics saying, we're the first Hispanic business. We don't hear Asians saying, we're the first Asian restaurant. We're the first East Indian hotel. They just go get the hotel. They just go get the business. They just go live in the house. They just go occupy the land. But because we need to be accepted and validated by somebody who does not have the power to validate or accept you, we're always declaring first. And the Spirit said, you know not what you're of. You ain't the first black man in the kingdom to do something. (laughs) Ain't nothing new under the sun. You're not the first African-American I've used to do something. The problem is you're regarding yourself after the flesh, not after the spirit. And as long as you stay there, you limit my hands. Oh, I got some teaching to do this month. Because your mindset plays into the mindset of your oppressors. You will only operate according to what you think they will let you do. Let me say that again. You will only operate in accordance to what you think they will let you do. But when you start operating according to what I tell you to do, and you don't worry about what any flesh thinks about what I've told you to do in spirit, then you will see the manifestation of God. And when I do it, don't give your flesh glory. Don't say I'm the first black woman, I'm the first black man. You say I'm a Holy Ghost filled Christian that God has put in this position to let everybody know about the Son of God and that if, hallelujah. One part of the church has failed because of perceived superiority. Another part is failing because of perceived inferiority. When in fact, we're all one. If you're in the body, you're one. The key is if you're in the body, if you're his, If you have his spirit, if you confess the name of Christ, you have to do. This is what Paul says to Philemon. He says, I could command you. Paul said, I could command you to do what I'm about to tell you. But because of my love for you, I'm appealing to you. Because I believe you got a good heart. But don't get it twisted. I'm sending him back to you, but I I could command you to let him go. As an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you profess to be a Christian, I could command you to, to obey the scriptures and the laws of God that you can't make your brother subservient to you. I could command you. I'm going to appeal to you, though, that when I send him back to you, you receive him not as your slave, but as your brother. So those who listen to me and they're thinking I'm trying to preach some kind of racist, radical. No, I'm appealing to you. I could command you. I'm appealing to you. I'm appealing to you out of love because I believe that many of us have fallen under the delusion of a country that is hypocritical. I'm appealing to you. See your brothers as your brothers. I'm appealing to you. 
I'm appealing to you. If you're listening to me and you listen to me from another country and you look at the oppression and the delusion of this country, you look at the black church and you think we're crazy, see your brothers as your brothers. Pray for us. Until you have lived under the vicious cycle of this type of oppression, you really don't understand it. The many of you who watch me from England, you don't understand the American system until you have lived it. So this is why Jesus, who knew his own people were under a system of oppression and didn't understand their own Savior, he didn't condemn them. He says, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So even when black folk are angry and kill one another, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If you train a dog to be angry, <clears throat> see, many of you may take offense to me making that statement, but the truth is you would agree to me saying you've been treated like dogs. So if you can agree to me saying you've been treated like dogs, then can you not agree to me saying you've been trained like dogs? And many of our violent brothers and sisters in the street who are killing each other have been trained like dogs. And what the Lord wants to do for us is release the anger that we have toward ourselves, toward others, and recognize who is our brother. Stand on your feet. Who is your sister? Who is your neighbor? Jesus said, he who does the will of my father, he is my mother and my brother and sister. He We're one race. Now here it is. We can't rise up and become what we are supposed to be unless you believe in who you are. Hear me, I'm concluding. I have more this month, but until you come to the place that you believe in who you are, you know not what you are. I need to help you today. This is going to be a challenge for some of us. I need you to do this because it's shackling you and it's holding you. And this is what the Holy Spirit wants you to do. Release your history and embrace your purpose in the future. I, I know this is Black History Month. I know what it is. But the Holy Spirit is telling me to challenge you today because you'll never achieve what you will in the spirit being shackled to your history. Release your history and embrace your purpose in the future. This is kingdom land. This is a kingdom challenge. Everybody can't accept this challenge. This is a kingdom challenge. Release your history and embrace the purpose of your future. Yeah. You're going to work as a black man, as a black woman, and you are missing the purpose of your future. You want them to know you're just as good as a black man or a black woman as anybody else they've hired, and you are missing the purpose of your future. The purpose of your future is to demonstrate as a kingdom citizen, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Ain't got nothing to do with no race. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. In this earth as it is in heaven. That's my purpose. My purpose, Tracy, is to reveal the kingdom in the earth. 
And that will cause everybody who claims to be black and claims to be white and other to see now the kingdoms of this world. Now y'all seeing what government looks like. Now you're seeing what life in the spirit looks like. We have no boundaries. We have no limitations. Stand, we have no anger. We have no bitterness. We forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. They don't know who they're crucifying. They don't know who they're lynching. They don't know who they're stabbing in the back. They don't know who they're trying to kill. They only know what they see. But they don't have eyes to see. Free me, God, from my past. There may be somebody that wants to be saved. To accept Jesus as your personal Savior. This is Liberation Sunday. Freedom from sin. If you want to be saved, raise your hand. If you want to be saved, raise your hand. We need to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you praise. We give you honor and glory. And the glory that we give you is not in the image of another man. For we no longer regard Christ after the flesh. We see him in spirit. We see him beyond his Hebrew origin. We see him beyond the crucifixion of the cross. We see him in the resurrected power of the Holy Spirit. And it is into the likeness of the power of the Holy Spirit and the newness of life we enter into him, into existence with him. It's in him we live and move and have our being. Father, we say it before you and before the throne, we cast down every lying image of Jesus. We cast down every negative thing that has held people back from coming before your throne boldly. We pray for the spirit of those who have misrepresented the church to the world. We pray for the spirits of those, God, forgive them for they don't know what they really do, God. We pray for our brothers and sisters that confess Christ, but the word declares, how can you love God whom you've never seen and hate your brother who you see every day? Pray for them to understand that as you're done to the least of them, they've done also to you. God, we stand without equivocation. We stand without reservation and hesitation. We stand, God, boldly coming before your throne as children. We're saying this, God, because many of the people who are under the sound of my voice have been made to believe they cannot be your child. They cannot bear your image because they do not appear like you in the flesh, but your image is spiritual. We need you this month. We need you to strip off the old and put on the new. We need our minds renewed in the understanding of your kingdom. I'm praying for every soul that's at the sound of the sound of my voice, both on stream and at this altar. Whatever the issue is that they brought to this altar, God, you know what it is. But we leave this altar enlightened. We leave this altar empowered. We leave this altar free. We leave this altar with a sense of liberty. We leave this altar full of the Holy Spirit and glory and grace. We leave this altar to go out into the world and let our light so shine that all men may see our good works and not glorify our race in the flesh, but our Father who is in heaven. God, we thank you. We can't say it enough like David if we had 10,000 tongues. We could not say it enough. We have to tell you right now for what you brought us through and where you got us and what you did in our lives. We got to give you a, high, a loud Shabbat, God. A thank you, a praise, God, for who you have been to us in spite of what 
We thank you, God. You are faithful. It is to you we give our glory. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Let every heart say amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise if you can. I gave you warning that to follow me on this one, you had to be mature and, and not emotional. There may be somebody out there you want to give to God, you can go to PushPay. If you're in the congregation, you can come forward. But if you're online, go to PushPay, text WOGCM 833-680-5952. You can give your offering there. I want to remind you that you don't have to wait until the first as we're doing our sacrificial gift as we're completing our project. You can give your sacrificial gift at any time, but we conclude on the first Sunday, March. Come on, let's give. Stand on our feet. Father, we thank you for the sacrificial gifts that have been given, for the faithful hands that trust you, given to your kingdom, for the upbuilding of your kingdom. Open up the windows of heaven according to your word and pour out blessings that they don't have room to receive. We don't have room to receive, God. We ask for wisdom that as we receive these gifts that we will continue to use them for the upbuilding of your kingdom. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in the earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, Lord. Let every heart say amen. Could y'all give me just one minute? We have some, oh, communion. I forgot. We got communion. And then, then after communion, we got a presentation.
Hallelujah. Show me the bread and drink the wine. We can have. That's so beautiful. He gave his life once for all time so we all could have sweet communion. On the day in which he was betrayed, he took the disciples to a large upper room and there he broke bread and said, this bread represents my body, which is given for you. Take it and eat all of it. Likewise, he took the cup. So it represents the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you. Take it and drink all of it. As often as you do it, you show the Lord's death until it returns. Before you go, you can stand, but there's a presentation we have for our beloved First Lady. I think we've got some sisters who want to come and show a little love for her, her buff day. That's so sweet. First Lady. One thing about you that we know for sure is that you are genuine, you are real, you're authentic. Your love for your family is real. The conversations and fellowships that you have with us is real. You are real and true to yourself and we are so grateful for that. This month is Black History Month. Everyone is celebrating and probably reciting Phenomenal Woman by Maya Angelou. But we recite and declare virtuous woman to you because that is who you are 365 days a year, not just for 28 days. So this year, we, we just want to um, pray and ask God to answer many of your, your, your prayers this year, that he'll give you health, that he'll continue to give wisdom to you, strength, understanding, peace, and most importantly, you will never go without his presence. So we ask you to accept these gifts from us and that you will enjoy it and that we love you with all of our heart. Happy birthday. All right, all right, all right. All right, all right, all right. All right, all right, all right. Good? All right. <laughs> no. <laughs> Look. Yeah, no, no, no songs, no songs. We'll be here 20 more minutes, no songs. <laughs> Listen, uh, God bless you all. Is there anyone that wants to become a member? If you want to join our church, raise your hand if you want to join our church. All right, we got a hand right there, <laughs> brother. I thought you already a member. You know where to go. All the counts in the rear, all right? All right, God bless you all. Uh, much love to you. God, good day. <laughs>